Welcome, friends. Welcome, friends, families, and uh, all guests here to Bethel of Mounds Worship today here on December 5th. We invite you to get in the mood for worship here this Advent season by singing, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Oh, come let us adore 
Hey, good morning, friends and families and all of you out there in Facebook land. It's Pastor Jim Beard here again, greeting you this wonderful Advent day. It is the second week of Advent, which is the season of preparation, of course, as we as we are preparing for the, the birth of our Savior again and to celebrate that. Um, it, it's a great time to be gathered in uh, here in Minnesota, at least in this part. A uh, little snow has fallen. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas just from that, and we hope wherever you are, you're beginning to feel that spirit as well. Um, you know, Bethel is the house of God, and all are welcome and loved here. And we are going to have a little topic today that says, you know, sometimes it's hard to go home. We'll get to that in a second, though. The, the whole series is called the, the Weary World Rejoices, you know, based on that great uh, song, O Holy Night. But uh, are you feeling a little weary? Are uh, you feeling a little tired? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stress that goes on, whether it's the holiday prep or who knows, maybe you've got sickness in your family or you're moving houses or whatever you're doing. There could be a lot of stress. So come take a breath with us. Come let your weariness be here. And you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to have it all decorated and put together. Uh, just take it a little step at a time and... Get as far as you can, but prepare here first. Glad you're, you're with us. Yeah, um, like I was saying, going home um, it sounds so nice, and it's a nice thing that we say here, but we really do mean it. But realizing, too, that uh, going home is not uh, always the greatest experience for people. Um, sometimes home means, uh, you know, we've got fears of going home, of what's going on there, and we'll open that up a little bit today, too, and... You know, it's not going to work out the way we hope if we go home for the holidays, etc. And, you know, maybe this just means we have to commit ourselves just a little bit more to, okay, bring in, bring in the kingdom, bring in the kingdom home. Uh, let it be part of our lives as well. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that, though. A uh, reminder, though, for today, for you online, today is the first Sunday of the month, and therefore it is a communion week that we're going to celebrate our Lord's Supper. Feel free to grab a uh, bread item and a juice item and have those ready for later on during our worship time together. We will bless those as uh, we are empowered to do by our bishop and say uh, blessings of Christ extend far beyond our reach sometimes. So we'll be doing that. Also, um, Advent means you want to bring forth a little more light, and we'll be lighting the Advent candle shortly. But I just wanted to remind you that at home, um, it, it's, it's much more alive and meaningful, we have found, for most folks, if you participate by doing these things too. And so whether you have one or several candles handy, I do encourage you as we light our candles to, to light your candle or candles as well. Uh, it just lets you enter into the whole experience more, be a part of it as well. Um, and, and maybe that's a good thing to, to add to the feed, just to, hey, I'm lighting my candle today, hope everyone's well. Uh, th that's one thing you can add. Are you lighting a candle or not? And uh, is there also just things to pray for that we'd like to, to know about? So let's uh, move into that candle lighting time. Um, you know, you may have noticed that it's just me today. Uh, I am going to lift up our whole staff here at uh, Bethel of Mound. Uh, uh, one sprained or hurt her ankle. Hopefully it's not broken. Had to go to the hospital for a quick check-in there. I'm not sure how she's doing. Two others have come fallen ill and are sick home. Um, that leaves me and... Uh, my, my ready-to-work elves, uh, Janet and Rachel here, but uh, God bless them for being here. But uh, prayers for all the other staff who are healing and not well, and, and for all of your families. There's just a lot going on. So let's, uh, let's <sighs> take a breath, settle in, remind ourselves that the light has come. Uh, here's our candle lighting for today. For many of us, the call to head home is one of joy and of hope. We can't wait to reconnect the family. 
with history and tradition, with a wonderful time of freedom and loving support. We can't wait to go home. There are those who fear going home, however, and there are times when going home brings back memories that are not so good, not so healing. We are reminded of when we didn't fit in, when we didn't measure up, when we weren't loved like we needed to be loved. Home can be a difficult place for some. The prophet Malachi teaches us that even when we are in the hottest of fires, there's a presence who can make us better, who can refine and purify. John the Baptist tells us that the road home is always under construction. Mountains leveled, valleys filled in to make smooth the path that leads us to our true destination where we can live in peace and unity with all. We light these candles, the candle of hope and the candle of peace, as a sign of our assurance that though the road is hard, we believe it is worth the journey. It is time to go home. And so we light our first candle again, the candle of hope. Oh, it's one of those days, isn't it? <laughs> and we light the candle for this day of peace. more light has come into the world, thanks to Christ. Sometimes, uh, yeah, we, we just can't wait to go home because it feels like a, a you know, reunion, a vacation, a respite from all the, the things that keep us jumping all, all over the place during these weeks of preparation. But uh, the joy uh, is, is also about going back to, for some people, going back to the, the family that loves you and wraps you up in their, their arms and it, it feels so good. That, that's part of what we pray for everyone. But we know that's not always the case. Uh, for others, uh, frankly, going home it doesn't have any of that feeling. It, it can be even scary. Uh, that's, uh, that's another dimension that uh, enters into our spiritual journeys here quite a bit. Uh, home 
is uh, for them a place of judgment, and maybe for you too. Maybe it's a place of division. It's a place of, of pain. Uh, so sorry if that is the reality you, you have. Families, it seems, can be the harshest uh, on, uh, on all of our souls. Right? They can, for some reason, we feel like we can just speak our peace in, in families, and, and even more so than with strangers. And, and it, it hurts even more, perhaps. So this is the reality that some face. It's not comforting. It can be downright painful. Uh, it, you can made, be made to feel like, uh, like, you, like you don't belong, or you're just not measuring up, or you aren't good enough, or you're just not welcome here, uh, whatever the reason is. People can be overwhelmed trying to, trying to have that sense of uh, family that you see on all these uh, Christmas holiday specials, you know? And, and why don't we have that? We, we ought to have that. And, but uh, we want you to be real here and to be honest that sometimes for these folks, uh, you can be afraid, afraid to go home. Um, you're not ready to go home. <laughs> you're going to be a long way from home, and that's just fine. Uh, if that's your reality, I think this message of what Christ is doing will be for you today. Yeah, into all of this uh, fear of home comes Jesus with a renewed sense of, of peace, a renewed Definition, even, of uh, family, a uh, renewed acceptance in the house of God in particular, and a renewed understanding of what it means to, to, to call God dad or daddy and uh, come on home. Oh, he painted whole new pictures of coming home here spiritually. <laughs> and uh, it it was, it is, it continues to be a renewal for souls that need that so much in a world that is full of judgment. Our lectionary readings uh, for this second week of Advent here uh, include uh, these two, uh, the four that are listed. The first one I'll be reading from is from Malachi, and the second from Luke. Malachi, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. So first we have this uh, prediction, that uh, uh, the prediction by God through the prophet Malachi, okay, in the Old Testament. Malachi jumps up there at the end of the Older Testament and and says, you know, uh, the one you desire will come and, and hang on, hang on. You, you think this is going to be a, a picnic? Uh, <laughs> no, Malachi says, you, you think this is going to be a walk in the park? <laughs> no, 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 not a chance. See, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, but who can endure the, who can endure, mm, the day of his coming? And who can stand mm, when he appears? For he is like a refiner of fire and like, like a fuller's soap. You know, without a d deeper understanding of what all those symbols mean, it, it, no wonder there's a sense of fear. I mean, being, re being refined by fire or cleansed with the harshest of lye soaps? Uh, ow, that, no thank you is what most people think when they hear these, these words. And, and, that, and that's how holiday dinners around the table, I think, can sometimes feel when uh, judgment is passed along with the potatoes. And, and you know, and that's how painful it can feel when, uh, when uh, righteous advice is given from the, the disappointed uh, relative across the way. And, uh, the, yeah, these, the, I'm going to refine you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. I'm going to, oh, my gosh. So th that's what usually comes to mind a lot of time for people when they hear these words. Uh, Harsh words may come spewing forth from people, and it, it just 
you know how your, your cheeks get all red? red. It's, like, it's like it's burning on your, your cheeks. And this kind of table being set in God's house. Uh, no thank you is what many people feel when they hear these words. So I, I bet you that's why they might say, yeah, give me fast food. <laughs> give me the drive through uh, I may be lonely, but at least I'm, I'm not being burned in the process. Uh, there's more to these passages, of course, but uh, is that not how many people will hear these words? Mm. But into all this fear of being being burned uh, and those feelings of uh, anxiousness at the, the holiday dinner table, um, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus with a, a, another, well, I, I would call it a much safer option and set of words. Here, here's what it says in Luke chapter 3, starting at the first verse there. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, uh, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, and the crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. Hmm. So, so Luke comes along, uh, first of all, to confirm that, that God's promises have come to pass. We've been waiting and waiting, and, and here they come. And one thing that just jumps out uh, before we get into all this stuff, it's just fascinating, isn't it, how, how, how things are written here. Uh, it, it's like it, it, what jumps out is that Luke uh, located this event historically, uh, not just once, not twice, but what, five or six times. He goes, and here's, here's this person in charge and that person in charge. Now, there must be something to that. Why would he spend precious time writing all of this? At one level, he is probably wanting to get across that this isn't, isn't just a, a parable or a, you know, once upon a time type of thing. You know, this is a. Uh, uh, this is how it was, a shake the foundations of the earth type of thing. This was a significant moment in history right then and there. And we have to remember, too, that he is, uh, has a background as a Gentile and is writing to his fellow Gentiles. This is what Luke is doing. And so let's remember that, that as this Gentile, that they have a different way of hearing things than compared to the Jews. If you're writing to the Jews, um, you know, and you're trying to teach them things, the, the story is the truth, okay? The, the facts need not be convincing because the truth is in the story. It's in the parable. It's in the, uh, oh, the poem. It's in the song. But, but for Gentiles? Yeah, for the Gentiles, it, you got to connect this to the facts. The facts, and which is often how our Western civilization likes to hear it, too. Give me the facts. And so Luke says, you want the facts? Well, here you go. It was in the 15th year of so-and-so and so-and-so. And, and you know all these people. And they're, they're right there. And it was right in that spot at that time. Look it up. But the gospel writers, e even Luke, uh, are not as much uh, concerned about history as they are about theology. What does this say about God? Oh, what is the nature of God that you're trying to get across here, Luke? What do we discover in these opening verses of chapter 3 about God? Well, let, let's just pause and look at that. It, it's fascinating. You've got Tiberius, uh, Pontius Pilate, Herod, Antipas, uh, Philip, Ly, uh, Lysanias, and Annas, and Caiaphas. They're, they're all powerful leaders that are listed, powerful leaders that are controlling the world. Politically or religiously, the, the whole thing, these are the, the major players, the high priests, the, the rulers of, of the land. And they're the ones who you might think 
the word would come to, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, I would think uh, if, you, if you, God were to talk to somebody, he might as well talk to somebody of influence, wouldn't you think? And, and yet, uh, <laughs> it, it's almost like uh, he chose, uh, you can have A, B, C, D, or E, and he said, none of the above. Uh, I'm going to go bring my news uh, to this, uh, this one who's just wandering around out in the wilderness. Doesn't this sound a little bit like uh, Luke, who's also saying the news is coming to uh, poor shepherds out on the hillside? You know, it's not always the rich who get all, and the powerful who get all of the inside information. It, it comes to people like, like John. John, who's there, wandering around. Wow. And God told John what? He said, okay, let's get things Started here. Let's let's start building the the way to to what can be. Uh, already, there are signs that God's family is. It's just not limited to the elite over here. It is for everyone, everyone, even the Johns of the world. Prepare the way. He tells everyone. Why don't you construct a a building project and, and get the roads ready because uh, it doesn't make this smooth. Let, let's uh, make sure that uh, the people and God can come together, this one that I am sending. Make way, straighten the highway, fill in the trenches, smooth out the bumps in the road. <laughs> Fascinating image. Make it accessible for the people to have access to the family of God point here is that there, there is work to be done, getting ready work to be done, opening up yourselves work to be done, change your heart work to be done, uh, start, start preparing, re repent, turn around, make things better, it's up to you, not just them, you make it happen, work to be done, all this is good news, and it's good for all people, it said there in, the, in that passage, all people who will see God's salvation. Now, if we read further, John the, baptize, but John the Baptist uh, chastises those who, who look for, oh, an easy way out using excuses that, well, they're, they're already a part of God's family because, you know, uh, we, we can have a family tree that traces our lineage back to, uh, to Abraham. Oh, yeah, so we're... We don't have to change anything. Ha! Baloney, says John. Baloney. You, God can create families of God out of the stones if he wants to, is how the next passage reads. You know, the axe is ready to fall on any family tree which isn't green and flourishing. Going, going home. Uh, to those uh, bloodlines that you say, to those branches that are like, it's like going home to dead wood. Well, yeah, those are the ones that are just going to be destined to be cut down, and uh, those can be thrown into the fire as far as we're concerned. <laughs> uh, wow. You can make families come out of the stones that are the family of God. <laughs> you just don't have to have the pedigree. And still today, still today, some folks feel like it's wrong or they're not quite all put together. If the, the restoration doesn't follow this, this cultural expectation uh, through the happy, healthy Christian nuclear family, you ever get the feeling that if you don't fit that mold, you're, something's not right in your family? And that's It's also not something that is revealed in Scripture that says this is the way it has to look. Okay, uh, Christian author Rachel Held Evans. We we pulled her in on videos before. We're going to pull her in again right now. Uh, she she lays it out in less than five minutes. She just states it as it is. It's not about the family you come from, is what she's going to say. God has a home of blessedness already for God's family. And Jesus came to create that new family. Take a listen. 
There's this tendency to elevate the nuclear family to this sort of godlike status. But I mean, the whole New Testament, the whole thrust of the epistles and Jesus's teachings too is that we're creating a new family. And it is for slaves and masters, men and women, Jew and Greek, all are part of this new family grafted into the family of God. So the notion that in order to be a good Christian, you have to be married with 2.5 children and a husband has to work, wife stays at home, these strict gender roles, that is a glorification of um, cultural values, American cultural values, the American dream. That is not a biblical value. Uh, the New Testament emphasizes a new family in Christ. Uh, not, and Jesus says, who, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? It's the people who follow after me. It's a new family. Uh, so we have to be careful of sort of glorifying, idolizing the nuclear family above all else. Are you saying the nuclear family won't save American communities? I don't think so. <laughs> Believe it or not, uh, I mean, I think I think Christ is salvation is in Christ, not in getting married, not in procreation. Uh, salvation is about being grafted into the family of God and welcomed into the family of God. Um, so, yeah, we have to be careful of of idolizing the nuclear family, idolizing culturally based gender roles and gender stereotypes, and we have to be very careful of leaving people out of the family of God, turning them away from the family of God because they don't fit into that idealized cultural expectation. And we see this happening with LGBT people. And what frustrates me most is seeing Christians slam the door of the kingdom in people's faces and saying, in order to be part of the kingdom, you have to be straight. In order to be beloved by God, you have to have a family and, and procreate and uh, all these other things. Um, when being part of the family of God is about being called and named beloved by God, being grafted into this new family, it's not about conforming yourself into these culturally based expectations about gender and sexuality. So a real tug on my heart lately has been the way in which um, there's a lot of Christians who think of themselves as gatekeepers to the kingdom. It's their job to decide who's in and who's out. They like to farewell people and say so long. And I just kind of had it with that. Um, it's not my table, it's not your table, it's not your denomination's table, it's Christ's table. Christ makes the invitation list. You don't have the power to farewell anybody. That's God's call who's invited into the kingdom, not yours. Um, so <laughs> have you seen the list? I, what's the of who's in and who's out? <laughs> I know people who think they've got the list. Um, which nothing frustrates me more than seeing the kingdom, the door to the kingdom slammed in people's faces. Nothing makes me angrier than seeing people use false fundamentals to keep people out. I just, um, when you look at the first people who followed Jesus, when you look at the New Testament, it's hard to find what all those people had in common. They were poor, they were rich, there were prostitutes, there were even Pharisees, there were tax collectors, there were sick people. No gay people. <laughs> well, they were outcasts, and in our culture, I think a lot of LGBT people feel like outcasts. So the, Jesus surrounded himself with this completely unlikely mismatched group of people. The one thing they all had in common, and I, they didn't all say the same prayer. You don't see them all walking down the Romans road or, um, you know, saying this sort of rote Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart type of a prayer. So you don't, you don't see them all confessing a creed or even agreeing on exactly who Jesus is. There was some discussion about that among his first followers. The one thing all of them have in common is that they're hungry. They're sick. They know that when Jesus said, I came for the sick, they know that means he came for me. They know that they need. So if people are hungry, if people are sick, if they know that they need, then they're in, they're welcome to the table. The table is not for the worthy. The table is for the hungry. Uh, I'm not worthy to come to the table, but I'm hungry. I'm desperately hungry. So if my neighbor is hungry, he's welcome too. I don't care if he's gay or straight or male or female or, or what. You get to come to the table not because you're worthy, but because you're hungry. 
Anyone out there hungry? Yeah. You're in. You're in. Your need is there. You can come. Um, are you are you sick? Are you in need? Guess what? The table is is ready to have you come on home to, and uh, it's ready for you, in particular. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the b- the bottom line is let us not fear coming home to God's house. Okay. That may take some work, and maybe that's your journey this year, but uh, this season, I should say. But uh, come home to the true sense of God's house. I, I love the place in the Bible where it says Jesus has prepared a place just for you in God's house. I believe that to be so. So, are you weary? That's what this whole uh series has been about oh weary weary souls come home and the good news is that god did send jesus i think to to welcome all of us to welcome you home to god's house again now that <laughs> that that news that is great news that is good news that is fulfilling news that that I think all of us can rejoice in. Amen. Time to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together here. Um, again, if you have a bread item and a juice item, now is the time to, to bring those forward. Um, you know, uh, part of our uh, ritual here when we broadcast with you is, uh, you know, we r- always have a loaf uh, in front of us. Uh, it's kind of a, a nice tradition that maybe this is what you can do too. I don't just go get, um, you know, plain white bread uh, from uh the cupboard, though sometimes if that's all we've got, that works. But there, there's always this, I'm going to go out uh, the day before and get one of those um, those breads that are just uh, made. And it's like every time the Lord's Supper comes along, it's something special. Um, I, I, I want to encourage you to, maybe maybe once a month you do get yourself a, 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 a loaf of bread that you can break with us. And it's something special because it is something special. Anyway, um, yeah, we come to the table, God, not because we're worthy. Boy, we confess an awful lot, don't we? We are not worthy. We just botched that up. We messed that up. That wasn't still working. And yet uh, we hear again and again how we're forgiven. Thanks to Christ, uh, whatever wrongs there have been are, are wiped clean. And we, we get to have another start at it again. And, and second chance, third chance, a thousandth chance to getting things right and better. And so we come humbly, not because we're worthy, but because we're invited to be part of this family. We are wrapped up in all the great things of what God has done for for humanity through all of time. And uh, it is this story of Jesus that just brings it on home, though. Wow. The worst that humanity could could do, um, he is uh, right before us in his death and resurrection there. And it's the day before that all of that is going to happen where he uh, takes the bread and lifts it up. In celebration, it's a celebrating time. And says, you know what, this is my gift to you. This is my body, which is going to be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the cup of blessing that was also lifted up, it's, a, it's all about forgiveness. This cup is a, a cup of forgiveness poured out with my, my very own blood so that you may be forgiven and know that you are loved in this family of God. And so we pray right now through uh, the Holy Spirit, through the airwaves from uh, here at Bethel, the house of God, to your house. Holy One, bless these elements uh, far and wide. Bless those who will receive them now so that uh, what comes in is a sense of um, of belonging and welcome and love and 
all the blessings that you have for us. Uh, Holy Spirit, pour, pour that out on these elements here and everywhere that as they are partaken, they feel your presence, the body, blood, and love of Christ. Bless us as we partake together. Amen. And so, we break the elements together. I invite you to pick up your bread, item, whatever it happens to be, and break it with me. Ooh, it's got a nice crispy crust today. Oh, it's a good loaf. Yeah. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Whatever cup you have before you, too, take and lift that up. Thank you, God. For Jesus said, this is a cup of forgiveness and blessing poured out for one and for many for, the, oh, for whatever forgiveness of sins needs to be forgiven. May this be so for all of us as well. So, I invite you to take a piece of the bread, dip it into the cup, partake of the elements together. We will return shortly after moments to do all this.
Welcome back to uh, this time of prayer now. We invite you to be in an attitude of prayer together. Gracious God, uh, these seasons in the church year, Advent and Christmas, hold together a difficulty and possibility, the realities of, well, brutality and beauty, weeping and wonder, hopes and fears. In Advent and Christmas, we hold together the now and the not yet. Creating God, we recognize that the world is not yet filled with justice, joy, peace, reconciliation, grace, beauty, or love. But it remains mired in and marred by uh, injustice and heartbreak, dissension, division, pain, terror, and unkindness. Light of light, we recognize that we live in a time when uh, the darkness is real, yet we know your light breaks in, and finally the light is stronger, and someday the light will fill and overcome all. O holy child of Bethlehem, we live in this tension between the now and the not yet. We live toward that newer world. And so, Holy One, we dedicate ourselves to its realization, trusting that your grace and the power of your spirit works in us and through us toward this newer world. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. That last poem, by the way, uh, was taken from a, our, our own Bishop David Bard's uh, um, posting of his blogs and ideas. Uh, I took that right from his blog this week. So thank you, Bishop David, for those insightful reflections for our time of prayer. Um, just as we keep getting ready and getting closer to that holy night, I in invite you to just uh, keep every day, do a little bit of devotion. And in case you're wondering, how do I find something to, to focus on? Um, uh, Bethel, on its Facebook and its website, uh, etc., will uh, have like a five, six, seven minute devotion maybe for you every Monday through Friday. We get those up there uh, nice and early in the mornings as best we can so that you can uh, tap into those and have a, a time of uh, just uh, reflection and peace. And uh, it's a great way to start whatever you're about to do. Take those five minutes and uh, hear the song, hear the scripture, have a little prayer time. Uh, that, that is there for your journey. So t please take advantage of that. Um, also, we have that newer resource that uh, if you like uh, that video, who, who, anyone like that video by Rachel Held Evans uh, today? Um, that uh, site has also given us another resource that has now been downloaded onto our website, and you can just go there at BethelofMound.org. And it says, are you weary? I click on that one, and it'll take you to this uh, the series. It's more of an in-depth process, uh, a weary world. Uh, many times churches will have something called a blues Christmas service, you know, where you're realizing it's not all happy and joyful, and we've got sadness and sorrow going on, and but the, the problem with those is many times they're just one night uh, at the church and people don't always want to come to those things. So what we did here is we put it all online for you. And you can just listen to th this other great speaker. She'll, she'll have like a 15-minute message. And then you can, there are other reflection questions, there are other resources, uh, even a, someone in, you could be in touch with if you want to talk about things with myself or, or one of uh, our friends who is a, certified spiritual director, or uh, as she likes to say, she's, a, she's a always becoming. She's not like she's there with all the answers, but uh, listens real well. Uh, we can hook you up that way, too. Just let us know. So use this time. Use these weeks. Use this to not just uh, uh, struggle alone, but uh, we have resources for you, and we hope you'll take full advantage of them. Um, we're moving closer and closer, and I just want to start saying, too, that uh, 
this is the time of generosity in, in churches too. Uh, not only to uh, year end to be thinking of the gifts you might be uh, doing to support, giving to support things like Bethel of Mound. We, we uh, find this a great time to, to also be doing that. But also uh, for Christmas Eve, there's a special offering that will be received. You'll be hearing more about that. Uh, Bethel especially likes the, to, to think of itself as feeding our neighbors around the block and around the world. And our two causes will do just that this uh, season. Don't have to wait till Christmas Eve either. Uh, we'll, we'll be sharing more about that shortly. But uh, yeah, prepare your heart to, to share some of that abundance that hopefully has come your way. And bless others who, who need some more abundance uh, to get through things. So keep that in mind, okay? Anything else? Mm -mm. All right. In that case, it's time to send you off. Send you off uh, uh, with our departing song, which is a, a newer song. It comes from uh, one of my favorite groups, though, of course, is uh, Casting Crowns. It, too, is a good one for this weary season. Um, it actually could be, I think, the theme song for the whole series. <laughs> if we, uh, we were going to play one and said, this is the, the one, this could definitely be... Uh, the, the theme song for this series as because here, here's just a little taste of what the lyrics say okay oh lift your head lift your heart Emmanuel will meet you where you are he knows your hurt he knows your name and you're the very reason that he came yeah <laughs> so click on over to uh to the YouTube on the link that's provided here before you get on with your day. Let that song just fill you up as well and bless you, we pray. All right, so it's time from this, this wonderful house of God and his family of God to your house, wherever that may happen to be and wherever you are on your journeys. May your weary soul find its way home, home to the Christ child again. And may you find that in the end you do, deep down inside, have that reason to rejoice. Blessings on your week.